Hey, hey, Millionaire University Nation. I am Brian Guerin back with you on the MU Podcast. And boy, do we have some fun today. We are tackling search engine optimization, SEO. We're going to be diving into this with my friend, Josh Peepmeyer of Merriweather SEO. And he's going to give us an SEO 101 masterclass because probably much like many of the listeners here, I'm a professional digital marketer and I still don't fully understand SEO. There is so much that goes into it. Google does not openly share what's in their algorithms and exactly how they operate and what exactly that they look for. We have a very good understanding of it. A lot of professionals do, but we'll never fully know what Google is doing behind the scenes. But from the information that we glean from professionals like Josh, we can understand how to better build our websites, how to better utilize our content how to build backlinks. There's so much stuff that goes into SEO. So I wanted to make sure we got Josh on here to give us a crash course in search engine optimization. He and I had a blast talking about it. So hopefully there's a lot of information that you're going to be able to pull from this and use to your advantage. You will have to bear with us as we were just starting out our pod that Josh's lawn care company came by and started blowing the leaves right outside the window. So we apologize in advance. If you hear a little bit of leaf blowing going on, you know, tis the season we recorded this in the heart of fall just a few weeks ago. So we did our best to edit it out, but hey, done is better than perfect. Josh had some awesome insight that I cannot wait to share with you. So enough chitter chatter for me. Let's jump in. SEO to me has been such a mystery. You know, we're kind of adjacent industries, right? I'm in marketing and you're in SEO. SEO is extremely important to marketing because if you have a a crummy website with terrible content or no content and no discernible SEO functions that are working for you, you're leaving a lot of business on the table. So for me personally, SEO has kind of just been that bugaboo. I think for years I kind of avoided it before really starting to do a deep dive once I started partnering up with Justin here at MU. So we have our own questions about SEO that I'm sure I'll throw at you as we go through today. But what is it about SEO that just makes it so mysterious? Yeah. So a lot of business owners actually have that same problem where SEO is super mysterious to them. And that's one of the reasons that they come to me. And we have some great conversations around that because they come to me and they have their paid media in place. They got some paid ads going. They even had their email going. They have everything else going. And SEO is kind of the last piece of the puzzle for them. But it's such a good opportunity because if you can put that piece into place, that has a lot of other benefits. It's additional revenue. It's different channels. It's a little bit more stable. So there's just a lot of different things that if you can get SEO into place, there's a lot of benefits for your business. And so, I'm yeah, I'm really excited to jump into it more today. Awesome. Awesome. And can you tell us a little bit about how you found your way into SEO? Yeah. So I actually never wanted to be an SEO. And that's kind of a funny thing to say coming from somebody who is an SEO. I wanted to be more of a direct response copywriter or something like that. But, you know, I had a degree in mechanical engineering, actually. And then in the last year of my degree, I was doing an internship and I had maybe a feeling that some of your listeners can relate to where I just felt like I was kind of stuck in a cubicle. I would go to the work, do the same thing every day. And it was kind of just, it was a project management job. So it was just pushing papers around, doing numbers, following people to make sure they were following up on things. And I said, you know what, this isn't for me. And so after that, I said, well, what do I want to do? And I felt this calling to get into entrepreneurship and to try some stuff myself. And so I tried a lot of different stuff. I tried UX design and research. I tried some Facebook ads. None of it went super well. And so eventually I got a full-time job just to sort of patch things up. And that job was in SEO. And it turns out that once I got into it, I sort of fell in love with it, you know? And so it was never sort of a goal that I I wanted to get into SEO, but sort of everything I had done up until that point sort of came together under SEO. It's a little bit of copywriting. There's some UX design. There's some website design parts of that, some coding, which I had done in the past and everything all sort of came together into SEO. And, you know, I got this job and eventually I still had that calling, you know, I had it on my heart that I was meant to do something for myself, to work for myself, to be an entrepreneur. And so I eventually started SEO on the side. Essentially, I was doing it in my day job and then I'd come home and do it for a couple hours in the evening and eventually got one big sort of contract client on the side that allowed me to quit my full-time job and get into it and 
kind of evolved since then. So now I full-time own my own agency, have some people working with me, and it's been a really cool journey, especially considering where I started, but that's kind of how I got into it. Okay, very cool. I love a good uh, entrepreneurial story. And it's funny how it works for a lot of us. You know, we're at a job or we're doing something that's adjacent or even directly related to what we want to do. And it kind of just, it falls in your lap sometimes. Love it. Absolutely. All right. So let's dive right in. I know you want to share with us your five steps to SEO success. So I want to give you the floor and just let you run with it here. Help us demystify SEO. You got it. Now we're gonna start simple here. Let's do step one, which is make a list of questions that your customers have asked or that you think they could ask. Now, even if you don't have a lot of customers yet, you're just getting started, something like that, you can sort of talk to people who could be potential customers and say, okay, what are the questions they're asking? Now this seems simple because there's a lot of misconceptions around SEO that's about meta tags and meta titles and technical this and technical that. But really at the heart of SEO, is providing really high quality information for the people that could become your customers, okay? And so there's a great book on this called They Ask, You Answer, which is all about a guy who owned a pool business. It was, you know, having some trouble. And then all he did was sit down on his computer every day and any questions that he had asked of him that day by customers, potential customers, his neighbors, his friends, all he did was write a blog post on the answers to those questions. And he did that consistently And he started to get some traffic from Google and that turned his entire business around. So really at the core, it's all about answering those questions that your customers have. So the first step, don't overcomplicate it. Don't get too technical. Just sit down and make a list of all the questions that everybody's asking you about your business or your potential business. Okay. So I know on my side of this, using Search Console, we're probably going to be mentioning that in another one of our steps here, but is this a good place where you can go and physically see what people are actually searching related to your topic. Yeah, so there's there's a lot of different ways that you can go and find places that people are asking questions. Search Console is certainly a good one. Now, especially when you're just starting out, Search Console could give you some pretty wonky ideas. So for example, my business, we're just starting SEO for my business. We just read it on our website and everything like that. And so for Meriwether, it's called Meriwether SEO. We're getting some relevant hits from Google around stuff like content marketing for e-commerce companies, things like that. But they're also giving us some credit for things like merry weather, like as in happiness or or weather or, or different things like that. And so at the beginning, especially when you don't have a lot of content on your site, Google doesn't really know what your site is about. So you have to take those proactive steps to tell Google, hey, this is what our site is about by writing some content on, hey, we're gonna write some content on SEO. We're gonna write about how much do SEO agencies cost. We're gonna write about all that kind of stuff and sort of give them that context. And then once you feed them that, they'll return the favor by telling you, hey, here are some adjacent topics that we think you should talk about as well. The Flowium, their CEO, Andre, he's actually used this exact method. All right, so I wanna hear some examples of real people who are using this in the real world. I know you mentioned me, Marcus Sheridan, Floium, Magnet Monster. Can you give us a little more details on those? Yeah, so the founder and CEO of Floium is my friend Andre, and he literally took that book, used it as his guide today, right now, and was like, what are the questions that my customers are asking? And he said that over the last year, SEO has become one of their biggest lead sources. And this is for an established company, an agency that's doing well. They do email marketing for e-commerce companies. And so they're crushing it with it already, you know, and then Magnet Monster is similar. So they're doing it less for the SEO. They didn't have SEO in mind. They just wanted to create content for their users again. This is actually another email marketing company. I'm less familiar with them, but I followed their journey a little bit. And now, they've decided about a year into the journey to really focus heavily on SEO and it's really jump-started their efforts. They're already starting to see some customers, some leads flow in from that content. So it works for any level at any stage. This isn't just beginner stuff. It's knowing what your customers are asking about, writing answers to those questions and doing so consistently. We'll talk more about consistency and content creation a little bit later too. Okay, wonderful. So step one, make a list of questions that your customers have asked or are currently asking. All right, let's hop on to step number two. What do you got for me, Josh? Yeah, actually, so this is perfect. This is a perfect segue here. Number two is create content regularly. So one of the things about SEO is that it's a little bit of a long-term play. You might've heard about this if you've heard about SEO, if you're hanging around in in digital marketing circles, right? Like Brian, I'm sure that you know this and you've heard this again and again, you know, it's a long-term play. So you gotta create consistently, you know? And so what does that mean? There's a couple parts to this. One of them is the tactics, right? So my recommendation is to create at least one piece of content per week. So about four pieces of content a month. 
you take some breaks for holidays and whatever, that's fine, but just keep at it every single week. I'd say try and create a piece of content each week that's about 1,500 words or more, okay? Word count can be important for SEO. It's less important now, the exact word count, than it was previously. But forcing yourself to say, hey, 1,500 words, how do I provide that level of value? Will force you to go deep on the content, on the topic, and cover it really comprehensively, which is super important. So when you say content, are we talking only blog posts? Could this be videos on your website? Like, help me define content. That's a really good question. So when I'm saying sit down and once a week create a piece of content, I am focusing more on blog posts, okay? Or it doesn't have to be in a blog section of your website. It doesn't have to say blog in the URL. I'm just talking about a long form piece of content that is kind of like a blog post where it's just about a topic and has different subsections, et cetera. You can create content on pages of your website. So for example, let's say you had a page on your website about the pricing of your service. You know, that's pretty common. You could add some content there. You could add some detail there. The point is just to create a page with the content on it. Now, I will say again that if you're doing it regularly and you're creating 1,500 words, that a lot of that's probably going to go to your blog. You don't want to put all of that content on your website. Brian, I'm sure that you're, you're really familiar with. From a conversion perspective, if you have 2,000 words on every page of your website, not everybody's going to read that, right? So you don't want to overwhelm that. So we can get in some tactical tips for the individual pages on your website later if you'd like. When I'm saying content, it is going to be blog posts and then some informational pages on the core of your site. I'm curious about not to go down a rabbit hole on this. Let's do it. To make it over 15, about 1500 words or more. What is it about search engine optimization that plays into word count? If let's say all your blog posts were anywhere from 700 to 1000 words, which is kind of a shortish blog post, right? Like pretty short. So does that ding you? Does Google and the, the SEO monsters look at you and be like, Ooh, this isn't very good. Even if it's like quality and it's hard hitting, but it's just not long enough. Does that ding you? Well, so that's a really good question. So this is just sort of a rule of thumb more than anything. Honestly, the best option is to decide what you're going to write about and then Google it and see what other people are doing. Now, what's happened over time is that Google is essentially just using an algorithm to decide, okay, what is good quality? And so over time, longer has become better. Now that's changed in the last year or so with some of the helpful content updates, they call it. Google updates their algorithm and they update how they read websites and how they value quality and all that kind of good stuff on a regular basis. And so they've updated that and they've started to recognize more that shorter quality is better. However, 1500 words from an SEO perspective is still pretty short. Now you gotta think about the topic too, right? If somebody's searching in Google, what color is grass, right? And you were to say it's green because of the chlorophyll and the light and the sun, it's going to get too long. So you want to have a pretty short answer for that. But if you have something like how much does an in-ground pool cost, it's really tempting and real easy to say cost $500 to $1,500 and just call it a day and just leave it. The goal of the 1,500 word, word count is to challenge you to go fully in depth and to cover the topic as much as possible. Okay. And so quite frankly, the content that we create at Merriweather trends over 2,000 words. And that's based on, we do some research for individual pieces. Every piece has uh, a lot of analysis that goes into it. But the 1500 words is sort of a good balance between, hey, it's not too long where it's going to be a huge chore to create it, but it's not short where it's going to have no value where other people are going to have covered it more in depth again and again over the internet. You mentioned the word count on your individual pages. Is the word count also important on those? Or is that as long as you're straight to the point, it's okay? Sounds like more is better. <laughs> in, in a lot of cases, yes. It is important, more is better, as long as there's not fluff. Google has become very anti-fluff. So another good rule of thumb is to answer the question as soon as you can in the content, and then just add detail after that. So maybe in that first sentence of that in-ground pool, how much is an in-ground pool cost? You'd say the average in-ground pool costs 500 to $1,500. I don't know the, the prices, by the way. I'm just spitballing here. <laughs> and then you'd say it varies based on all these factors. And then you talk about, okay, here are the finishes that you can use and how what's the size? And then what are the calculations for the size? And hey, here's a calculator that you can use to sort of determine what size is going to work for you. And here's the formula that we use. You know, like what are the things that you actually use internally in your own company or in your own thought process to make that decision. So Brian, for you, hey, how much does a website cost? Well, that's a big question. You know, you could just say 500, you know, $0 if you do it yourself all the way up to 
millions of dollars if you're Amazon, but what goes into that? The point here isn't necessarily that you have to do more, but that you wanna cover it in as much depth as you can. Now, again, if it were a super simple question about how old is Taylor Swift, you're not gonna go in depth on that. And there are sites that do this and they just have databases of very short pages and that's it. You know, And so it's all about the topic, but challenge yourself to think about what are all the subtopics here? What is the nuance here? What are the things that I can say that add value that really cover this comprehensively? Okay, perfect. And then frequency, you said at least one post once a week. Is there any benefit or for your clients, do you guys do three posts a week or is it more, is it advantageous for one company versus another to do more or less? Or is that once a week, a blanket recommendation? So this is an area where more is almost always better. Our clients, we like to do at least two a week, but a lot of the big publications that you'll see that do a lot of SEO, Forbes, you know, like a health line and sort of the health industry, big sites like that that show up again and again, those guys are doing one or two posts a day you know, and so they're doing 20, 30, 40 posts a month, you know, and so more is better. Once a week is more about creating a habit. We do have some clients that just post once a week and that's fine, but more would be better. Now, at some point, you're going to sort of run out of topics in your industry. And if it's a big industry, that's going to be pretty quick. If it's a relatively simple industry, maybe you're going to run out of topics pretty soon, you know, but in my experience, even in simple industries, if you write one piece of content a week, you could do that for a year at least before you even start to run out of topics, right? So I'd say once a week for a full year is a good starting point for any business, no matter where you are. Okay, gotcha. I'm thinking in terms of like digital marketing, I'm having my web guy put together a new website for me and a big part of this is going to be the blog. I intend to use Search Console and Google Trends to really see what is out there in terms of what should I write about? What are my people asking? But I I guess I could envision at a point where, let's say I put 30 of them out there, and at some point, you know, there's going to be 10 of them that are turning out the lion's share of results. Is there a point where the content stops or do you recycle it? Maybe that's a creative part of my brain where I'm going to hire someone who's more creative than me to continue with that. But what's your opinion on that? Well, can you tell me a little bit more? You said... The creativity part of that is the issue that you're running out of ideas or that you just want to use your resources the best. Tell me a little bit more. Yeah, I think I'm probably not alone where people are worried about, you know, I don't have enough ideas of of what to write about. And I've done the top 15, 20 things that Google says is being searched. You know, is there a point to saying like, okay, I would like to write about this, but Google doesn't really tell me anyone's searching for that. So why waste the time? Mm. But if more is better, I mean, I think it still depends on what the actual more is, right? Yeah. And so that's a really good point as well. So there's two parts to that. One is that if you start to run out of ideas and you just can't think of any more, and the first thing I'm going to do is say, hey, have you talked to your customers? Have you? When was the last time you interviewed a customer and you talked to them and you said, hey, you sat down with a notebook right afterwards and a notepad and you said, what did they actually ask me? Okay. So well, that's the first initial thing I'm going to say. I'm going to challenge you on that. Number two I'm going to do is I'm going to say, cool, go and look at some competitors that are really successful with SEO and see what they're writing about on their website. So you can go to their blog. You can go on their informational sections on their website and get some really good ideas there. And the more accessible piece of content is on their website, probably the better it's doing, right? So if something's doing really well on your website, you're probably going to have it on the first page of your blog. Maybe it's going to be updated recently, something like that. If you have a tool like a paid tool, like an Ahrefs or a SEMrush, and we'll talk about that a little later, you can go in and do some competitor research to see what pages on their website are doing well. And then you can use that as inspiration. Now, the other part of it though is, should I write about a topic if it's not getting a lot of search demand? And the answer is yes. If your customers are asking, you need to write about it for two reasons. One, because the keyword research tools are almost always inaccurate. I've written blogs or had my team write blogs that are targeting keywords that supposedly have zero search volume. And that exact piece of content brought a thousand clicks to our site in that month or to our client site. So they're almost always inaccurate. So you just don't know. Number two is that we actually regularly tell our clients to write about topics that have no search volume, because if you do that, you're showing Google that you're an expert on the space. Now it can't be just completely out there. It can't be completely irrelevant. But if you're saying, hey, I'm in the pool industry 
And I want to talk about all the different pool filters. I don't know why we're going off on pools here, but that's what we're <laughs> going to stick with. It. And it's like, your customers aren't asking what kind of pool tools are the best, but if you write those blog posts, if you answer those questions, you're showing Google that you are an authority, right? Like if you go to a barista and you say, is this coffee good? And they're like, oh yeah, definitely. It has notes of vanilla and honey and the roast is really nice and it's subtle. And you're like, I didn't ask about any of that. <laughs> but you know, if that person says that, that they know their coffee, right? And so it's it's kind of that same vibe. So definitely write about it. If you're getting questions about it, write about it. If you're running out of ideas, you can look at competitors. You can go talk to your customers and almost always you'll be able to find one or two more things that you can write about. Okay, wonderful. I definitely let us down a rabbit hole there, but that was some gold you had there. All right, let's pop on over to step number three. Let's do it. Okay, so step three, and this is where we're getting crazy. Step three is to do keyword research. So a lot of people are gonna start with this step. They're gonna say, cool, I'm gonna go look at some keyword research tools and figure out what Google says I should write about. But really it's the third step in the process because if you do a bunch of keyword research and you're not creating content regularly, it's not gonna matter because you're just gonna have a list of keywords that you should target and nothing to actually go with it. So keyword research is all about matching the questions that your customers ask with what Google is telling you. So like maybe your customers are asking, hey, can you give me some information on pool pricing or how much does a pool cost? And it turns out that Google actually splits pool pricing into two separate categories. How much does an in-ground pool cost and how much does an above-ground pool cost? So if you write one article on just how much do pools cost, you're not gonna be targeting either effectively and you're not gonna rank for either. So the third piece is you say, okay, what are my customers asking me? And then you go find keywords that fit with them. Okay, and to do this, you can use a bunch of free tools. You can even just use Google Autosuggest. So if you actually go to google.com, not just using your browser search bar, right? But you go to google.com and you type in pool pricing, you can sort of see what pops up and that'll give you some long tail variations, which are a really good opportunity. Or you can use some free tools, even the free plan from tools like Ahrefs, A-H-R-E-F-S.com or moz, moz.com. They both have some really good free keyword research tools. And all you gotta do is sort of enter pool or pool pricing in there, and it'll give you a list of variations around what are the specific keywords that are actually getting searches in Google. Yeah, I've heard a lot about Ahrefs. Yep. And I've seen that in play a little bit. You mentioned in the last section that some of these research tools are inaccurate. Yes. Are these going to be a little bit different than, I think we're speaking more specifically of the Google search tools. Is Ahrefs going to be a little bit more reliable or are they all kind of playing in the same pool? Google search console is actually going to be the most reliable tool out of all of them. Now it doesn't give you 100% of the information and they tell you that if you look in their documentation, but it does give you a proportionate representation. And what I mean by that is, hey, if you get 30 clicks to your website about pool pricing and you get a you know 70 clicks to your site about pool types, they might only show you three clicks about pricing and seven clicks about types, but you know that it scales up to the actual numbers. So if you go to Search Console and you're already getting some clicks to your site, it'll show you which keywords are the most popular, where you're getting the most impressions, which ones to target, and that's actually gonna be the most accurate, but it doesn't work until you already have some traffic coming to your site. Now, Ahrefs, all of these other tools, those are all less accurate because they're sort of guessing and they have some very complex systems on the back end that do that guessing for them. They have algorithms, et cetera, but those are gonna be slightly less accurate than just looking at the dedicated Google specific data. Okay, very interesting. I've always wondered about that. All right, very cool. So that's step three, doing your keyword research, very important. All right, step number four, this one's always been very curious for me, so I'm excited <laughs> to see what you say about it. Yeah, yeah, so let's jump into it. Step four is build backlinks, okay? And so a little bit of background on backlinks, right? What are they? Backlinks are essentially when somebody links back to your website from their website. So if you say, hey, here's a really great blog on XYZ, and then you link out to another website with that article on it, you're sending that site a backlink. And that acts as a vote of authority for that other resource. So that says, hey, I trust this other website enough to send some of my users over there to recommend it as a resource, okay? And this concept of using backlinks is actually what made Google Google. No other search engine used backlinks until Google. And so this is very important for them. It's sort of in their DNA. Now, this has kind of been a black box for a lot of people in the SEO industry because it's kind of tough to do this at scale. How do you get other people to link to your site, especially if you're not known that well? 
And the best way to do this is to build real in-person relationships, right? Like Brian, you and I have a real conversation now. We're real friends. We have real like human conversations. If I were to go to you and say, hey, would you mind sending a backlink to my website? Hey, would you recommend me as a resource for e-commerce SEO? It would probably not be a huge ask, right? It would just be say, can you put a link on my site? And in the same way, if you said, hey, could you send a link to my website? And I'd be like, no problem. It's just, I got to go on. It's my buddy. I'm going to go on and put a link on my site. It's not a big deal. And so the best way to do this is to build in-person relationships, even if you're, again, sort of in a less technical industry, say something like a contractor or something like that. Again, you can offer to help people with their website. Say, hey, you have a quick question. I've been doing SEO on my site. Let me help you get the basics set up for you. Do you mind if I put a backlink to back to my site? We'll do it to each other. Those kinds of real relationships where you can add value and say, hey, here's a resource that you should include on your website, or here's something that you should put on your website. You can build those relationships and then you can ask them to build a backlink. Maybe you even offer to build one to their website in return. What constitutes a backlink? Like where in practice do you see a backlink? Is it when... If I'm writing a blog post about the new pools that I build and I reference a uh, pool liner company, it happens to be owned by my buddy, right? So we have an article about the importance of vinyl pool liners and da da da, as I've learned from uh, Joe at Joe Smith Pool Liners. Is that a backlink? Like, where are all the places that we can see and insert or receive a backlink? Yeah, great question. So that would definitely be a backlink as long as you're linking to their site. So if you just sort of mention them in passing, it's not considered a backlink. You have to actually physically say, okay, here's the link and here's the resource. Kind of like even if you were doing a school paper or something at the very bottom, when you're doing, you know, like the APA formatting or whatever at the bottom, you don't link out to other people. But sort of in modern times, if you're saying, hey, here's my paper, I'm going to submit it in a Google Doc. And at the very bottom, they say, no, you actually have to link out to your resources. You have to link out to your sources. And then you have a link from your paper to the source that constitutes a backlink. That can be in any form. You can link images, you can link text, the ideal form is to link text that's on the body of your website. By the body, I mean not in the navigation, not in the footer, which is all the links at the bottom of the site, but in the actual content that you're talking about and to link in a contextual way. So to say, hey, you know, my friend Joe at Joe's Pool Liners, right? If you were to link Joe's Pool Liners, if you were to use that copy, that text, in other words, that's called an anchor text, to link to his website, you're sending Google, hey, this website is about pool liners. And so if somebody's looking for pool liners, this is probably a good resource. So any link coming to your site is considered a backlink if it's from another site. The best ones have some context in them, are in the actual body of the content that you're doing, and add a little bit of information with the text that is linking back to your site. Interesting. Okay. So actually natively on a service page or the home page or something, having a link in this case would be a link on someone else's site that links back to on, on their home page. Let's say it's a section of their home page that links back to you. That would be a big time type of backlink to have. That would be a big time win. Yeah. People don't really like to do backlinks from their home page. Uh, they like to do them from blog posts and things like that, which for that exact reason, because that is a big time backlink, you know, and if you, you see one website doing that, then a bunch of other people are going to ask you for it too. So right. yeah, that would be the best. That would be, that would be incredible. What does Google think in terms of not necessarily scoring? Well, maybe it's scoring, but like how many backlinks should I have? If I have, let's say I have five friends in the pool business and we all backlink to each other once or twice or however often. Is Google going to look at that and be like, okay, these are like super teeny tiny sites, like who cares? Or do you need like hundreds of these? What's the quantity of this? I know quality is high, but what, what's the quantity need to be? Yeah. And that's a really good question. And it completely depends on industry. So if it was just you and your pool buddies, yeah, that would be a teeny tiny site. However, maybe there's no one around you that really is doing any better than that. Because, you know, it, in the pool business, it's not that common to go out and actively build backlinks. Now, if you have a CBD company, the only channel available to you is SEO essentially because all of the ad platforms sort of ban you from their platforms to begin with. So SEO is the only thing. So to be competitive in CBD, you might have to build literally thousands. Amazon has millions of backlinks because everybody wants to buy something. What's the first place they're going to link to? It's Amazon, you know? So they have millions. In the CBD and like really competitive spaces, thousands, tens of thousands is, is the goal. If you are a local business, even 10 or 20 can be a really good start. And by the way, you can build yourself some free backlinks from things like 
your Google My Business profile or a Yelp profile or the Better Business Bureau. And Google knows that these are all free and sort of values them accordingly, but that still gives information. It says, hey, this is what our business is about. We are legit. We have profiles on all of these other sites. It's not like we're just a sort of flash in the pan. We're just gonna build our website and call it a day. We actually care about our online presence. So just starting with some of those free sources, free resources in your industry is a really, really good start. If you're just a local shop, 10 or 20, 30 is a really good start, but it scales all the way up to needing tens or thousands or you know hundreds of thousands even in some cases. Right, right. And I'm really glad you mentioned the Google business profile. That's a big part of uh, what we do at my agency is managing that for our clients because, and you confirm or deny this for me, but I believe over the past few years, Google has started to place more and more emphasis on the quality of your business's Google business profile, formerly known as Google My Business. And I've noticed that with a few of my clients when we started taking over their accounts, we started bumping up their five-star ratings, replying to those ratings, posting two to three times a week on the little post function, adding images every week, making sure their hours are updated, putting out updates or offers via the little posting mechanism. We've noticed a huge uptick in traffic to the website from that. So I feel like I have some personal experience in seeing that be true, but I wanted to get your opinion on that. 100% dude, that is so important and it has only become more important. So, you know, there's kind of two parts to that. By the way, the last time I worked significantly on Google business profiles, if I'm getting the naming right, was two or three years ago. So I think they've changed the name since then. The first part is that Google is now promoting the business profiles high on the SERP more often. So now if you search for anything, you say, hey, I want to get you know, lawn care or anything like that. Now, instead of sort of showing you national companies, the first thing you're going to see in searches is, is like the, the pack of like five businesses or three businesses or whatever, right? So that's becoming super important because those show up again and again and again. The second part of this is that you're 100% correct. Like having a really good profile is super, super important for SEO. In fact, in terms of local SEO, trying to get show up in organic results for people around your business or near your business actually geographically, that might be the most important part of SEO. Because like I said, it shows up more. And if people are searching for stuff on maps, that's the way people search for stuff now. You wanna find some lawn care, you're gonna to go to Google Maps on your phone, you're gonna open it, you're gonna see lawn care near me and you're gonna see who has the most five-star reviews. Yeah, and then those five-star reviews are what gets you up there, right? And so so you know all about that. Yep, and that's honestly, as a consumer, that's how I find what I'm looking for. I'll open my Maps app. I don't even go to Google search anymore. And I'm just going straight to Maps and it's just, I mean, I, I can't emphasize it enough and, and it's a free resource, right? That's, I, in my experience, so many business owners, they know about it but they don't put any internal importance, whether it's themselves or delegating to somebody within their business to manage this profile or outsourcing it to people like us, because right. <laughs> I understand the incredible impact it can have on your business and on your search engine optimization, bringing people to your website by providing an incredible experience for the searcher. And that's honestly, that's the whole reason Google is in business or Google search is a thing, right? Because Google's customers are searchers and they want to appease their customers by sending them to relevant solutions to the problem they're asking Google to find. 100%. And that's why if you have a really well-managed profile, Google business profile, you're going to start showing up for adjacent searches. You're going to definitely show up for direct searches, but Google's going to look at your profile. And let's say you're, you're a deck builder and you know, in any given town, there's 15 to 30 of them, right? Mm -hmm. If you have the profile that has uh, consistently the most five-star reviews that are always replied to like a thank you, yeah, and you have consistent posting, consistent images, it's continually updated, Google's gonna be like, ooh, this person's searching for um, deck builders near me, I'm sending them to you. 100%. Because you have an incredible profile and there's a great chance that means your website's pretty well put together too, right? It's cyclical, but it's it's all important. Well, and by the way, the people that are gonna be finding you there are the money. Those are the people that need something and they want it near them and they're in your local community. So they might've even heard of you. They might've seen, oh, I've seen the trucks drive by. You know what I mean? So like that is some of the best quality traffic that you can get is on those profiles. So 100%. The people who search on Google are problem aware, not to go down a marketing rabbit hole here, but you're problem aware when you're searching on Google because you know what your issue is and you're trying to find that solution. So in the buying journey, you're already one step ahead of somebody who's not problem aware or maybe they're seeing cold traffic ads. No, no, no. You know that I need a new deck and I need it soon. Google, tell me who offers this service so I can call them and get an estimate. Love it. 
Awesome. All right. Not not to beat a dead horse there, but uh, that Google business profile importance cannot be overstated. All right. So that concludes step four, building backlinks. Let's head into step number five. What do you got, Josh? Yeah. So step number five is all about refinement. In fact, just for step five, call it SEO uh, refinement, refine your SEO strategy. So the purpose here is kind of two parts. So one, you want to start to tailor things and hone in on your most valuable keywords and things that are already driving business for you, things like that. But the second part of this is to realize that you got to always update your content. So Google loves fresh information. They love new information. So if you said, hey, here are all of the best in-ground pools that you can buy or all the top types of in-ground pools that you can buy, but you wrote that article seven years ago, well, maybe new kinds have come out since then. So you got to update your content and keep it fresh. So after you've done that for a year, and actually this is a really good sort of practice is after that first year, go ahead and check in and see, okay, what are some of the pieces that are performing very well that I can maybe add a little bit to and sort of boost them even further? Or what are some pieces that aren't doing as well, but should be doing very well that have some, some search traffic behind them that are targeting keywords that are valuable to me. Okay. And so then you can go and update those so that they perform better. And these can again be blogs on your website, pages on your website, things like that. Now, this is where Search Console is going to be really, really important, right? So now you're going to have it set up. And at this point, you're going to have a bunch of data to work with. You're going to have data directly from Google telling you, hey, here's what we think your website is about. Here's what we think is valuable on your website. Do you think, you know, maybe you could write about this? And so you can dig in there and you can find a bunch of keywords and Google will literally tell you in Search Console, hey, you're on page five for this. You're on page six for this. You're on page three for this. And so if you go in there and you look at everything that you're sort of in the middle of page one, so a position sort of five or down to position 15, and you look in there and you say, okay, what are all the pages and the keywords that I have in this area? And you go and you update those. That's when you're going to start to see some really compounding returns because Google's telling you, you're almost there, you're close, you just need a little bit more to get you across the line. And so you get some more backlinks, you can, you know, rewrite the content, update the content a little bit, you know, and that'll be really, really important. The second part of this is finding keywords that are driving business, right? So do you get people calling you and they say, hey, I read your article about pricing. I'm really curious to see what your pricing specifically is or what the pricing is specifically in my area. And you say, cool, that pricing article is money. It's giving me customers. Okay. If you know that, then you're going to write more of those articles. So maybe you say, cool, I did one for in-ground pool pricing. Maybe I'm going to do one for above ground pool pricing, or maybe I'm going to do it for pool maintenance pricing or something like that. You just know that that works. You know, and by the way, I've come up with a whole list of keywords that are almost guaranteed to convert. Like we've seen them convert again and again and again. I'm gonna make that available as a resource for your listeners. And so we can figure out how to get that to them. But yeah, that's gonna be the second part of it. So one is just making things perform better in terms of clicks and appearances in Google. And the other part is finding, hey, what are the things that are actually making me money and driving new customers and then doing more of that as well. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. And there's one thing I've been wondering about. I think it's an old school SEO thing, just a general question on it. I think in the old days, keyword stuffing was a thing, right? Like where it was, you know, oh my gosh, I need to use these three main keywords about my business all the time. And you'd read some of these just insufferable blog posts or pages on websites and Google started cracking down on that, right? So I I just want to dispel the possible still surviving myth that you need to absolutely obliterate your content with keywords. 100%. Yeah, yeah. That is an old school method. That is, if you do that, your site's not going to get any traction whatsoever. So if you choose a keyword, step three, you did some keyword research and you say, hey, I'm going to target how much do in-ground pools cost? You know, it's a good idea to have that in the title of your post. So if you see a, a, an opening for a meta title on your website in the back end, WordPress and, and Wix, and a lot of them have an opening for like a meta title, you put it in there. The H1 of your website, which is sort of the main title that you see on the page, you put it in there. And then you mention that keyword and maybe a couple close variations in the post. That does signal to Google that, hey, this is a relevant piece of content, but that's it. Like you don't have to do 30 different variations and do, you know, the in-ground pricing of your pool is related to the pricing of in-ground pool components you know, like none of that, you know, keep it readable, keep it relevant and you'll be fine. But yeah, definitely do not keyword stuff because you will get penalized. Google does not like that at all. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Josh, just to recap, we went through the five key steps to SEO success, which was step one, making a list of the questions your customers have asked. Step two, create that content regularly. Step three, do your keyword research. Step four, build backlinks. And step five, refine your SEO strategy. Any parting thoughts for our listeners on the importance of SEO or how to just get started with it? 
the thing I say about SEO is that SEO is kind of like a business within your business, right? To start a business, you have to have a lot of perseverance. You got to have dedication and it really has compounding results over time. SEO is kind of like that. It takes a little while to start. You got to have that perseverance. You got to have that dedication, but it's really, really worth it in the end. It can be one of your best channels. It can be one of your most profitable channels. It can make you a lot of money. You just got to have the perseverance to get into it and to get started, get your feet wet, and then refine as you go. It's a really good channel. It's a lot of fun. It's like a big puzzle and you just got to keep working at it but definitely recommend you get started. Awesome. Well, Josh, how can we find you? Yeah, absolutely. So I am on LinkedIn, Josh Peetmeyer. Otherwise, you can find my agency, Merriweather.digital. The, the easiest way to find that is probably just to search Merriweather SEO. Got to keep Mary and weather as one word together. Any way you spell that, the real spelling is a little bit weird. So any way that you spell that, if you keep it one word, Merriweather, and then you tag SEO on the end, you'll find us. Okay, wonderful. And then perhaps we can link to that list of keywords you have in our show notes. So we'll make sure we make that available to the listeners. Let's do it. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And uh, maybe we'll see you again here on the Millionaire University podcast. Yeah, that'd be great, Brian. Thanks for having me. It's been amazing. All righty. And let's hear it for Josh Peepmeyer of Merriweather SEO. That was an awesome head first dive into SEO. Man, he was so right. I think my favorite part about that is his comparison of SEO being like a business within your business. You know, it's something that the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next best time is today. SEO is like that because it is not a short term gainer. It's just one of those things that in your business, not everything is going to happen overnight. In fact, most things are not going to happen overnight. And SEO is absolutely one of those big things. But with the proper care, the proper time and attention given to it, later down the road, it is going to reap massive, massive benefits. So I hope you enjoyed learning about search engine optimization with Josh here today. Be sure to keep tuning in to Millionaire University Podcast. We love having you here and sharing our insight with you on the regular. So with that, we'll catch you guys on the next episode. 